Well, good afternoon, everyone. I see that the time-honored tradition that our students have of sitting in the back is also adopted by our guests and friends, even if they're no longer students. But there are lots of seats down here in the front. So uh, for those of you who would like a better view, I'd be, uh, we'd be happy to accommodate you a little bit closer to the stage. Uh, I want to welcome uh, the members of the RIT Board of Trustees, our distinguished guests, colleagues, students, staff, and friends. This is a very happy day for RIT. Today marks an important milestone in the history of RIT as we inaugurate the Eugene H. Fram Chair in Applied Critical Thinking. And this unique position, we can clap. Yeah. <laughs> position signals, a, I think, a decisive and real commitment on the part of this university towards ensuring that all of our graduates, both undergraduate and graduate alike, acquire and demonstrate critical thinking as an essential lifelong skill. I can think of no goal that is more important for our students and faculty than the continuous pursuit of critical thinking and the brief editorial comment, I think we've seen all too little critical thinking in the current election season. <laughs> Students increasingly demonstrate that this is also a key competency that our employers want and you expect from our graduates. It, in a deeper and more profound sense, however, can help our students understand themselves, their place in the world, their own sort of real common. In short, applied critical thinking must be a vital component of higher education. Today we demonstrate that RIT is in the vanguard with respect to this, and we will work tirelessly to make it a priority. In fact, it's my hope that this is the first step toward RIT becoming known as a national and hopefully international center of excellence in applied critical thinking. It's entirely fitting that this chair honors Eugene H. Fram, the J. Warren McClure Professor Emeritus of Marketing, in the Saunders College of Business, and a member of our faculty for a remarkable 51 years. <laughs> Gene's Socratic approach, his intellectual rigor, and frequent use of case studies made a lasting impression on generations of our graduates. Professor Fram so dramatically influenced one of them, of former student who took a single course from him over 35 years ago, that this student decided to honor him by endowing this chair. This RIT alumnus who desires to remain anonymous has noted, quote, my successes were due in no small measure to Gene's insistence that clarity of thought is a fundamental principle. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gene Frank. appreciate the fine, fine introduction. And uh, I just wanted to also point out that I'm very pleased to have members of my uh, family here who have uh, traveled with me from California, uh, where it's nice and warm. And uh, <laughs> when I went outside today, I realized what a fall day in Rochester is. Although there was no rain, it was sunny, it was pleasant walking, and I managed to, uh, to, uh, to handle it after, after many, uh, four years out on, on the west, uh, west Coast. I'm also pleased to see uh, the number of students uh, that, are, that are here, and I understand they're both graduates, uh, students and undergraduate students here, uh, because uh, these students are the ones who have curiosity. These are the students who see what the future can, uh, can bring. Uh, so at the reception afterwards, if you want to talk to any of these students, I'm sure they will uh, be happy to talk to you about opportunities that you may know in your firm uh, on, uh, for co-op or even, uh, even, uh, even placement. Uh, some of them uh, are only uh, uh, 2000, will graduate in 2016 and 2015. Uh, so if you can 
uh, make a, a develop a relationship with one of these students. You have a person who has curiosity, I assume can work very hard, and will, can be the ideal uh, colleague that you would, you would hope for. Now, my job here uh, uh, this, this afternoon is to talk about dreams. And uh, I want to talk about dreams in uh, three respects. One, I want to talk to you about the professor's dream, or what my uh, grandson, who's at Boulder, called the Hollywood story. Uh, and that's going to be the first uh, uh, dream that I'm going to talk about. Next, I will talk to you about the anonymous, anonymous donor's dream related to critical thinking. And uh, Professor, uh, President Dessler, I, I want to promote you. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, it's always, well, I always felt that you moved forward into teaching. Okay, uh, uh, we, we have this, uh, the same conclusion there. Uh, so I want to tell you about the donor's dream related to critical thinking, a little more than, uh, than what we have here and than, than President Dessler uh, uh, discussed with you. Then I'm going to introduce what I call the dream weaver, which is Dr. Chip Sheffield, who will launch the, uh, uh, the session with, a, uh, with an introduction of our uh, distinguished guest and also two people who respond uh, to our guest at the end of the lecture. Uh, at the end of the lecture. So let me get started. Uh, when this chair was announced and, uh, 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 and uh, during the period of the, uh, uh, of the search committee, uh, the qu major question that I was asked, how did I do this? What did I do uh, that motivated uh, this student who I hadn't seen in 35 years uh, to uh, put forth this, uh, 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 to endow this chair? Well, uh, a couple of things that, uh, that occurred when I met him. I didn't get this information until about a month later. Uh, after it was announced and we had met personally out in California and he said there were a couple of things uh, that, that I did there. Uh, he was uh, not a marketing student, which I had assumed from the beginning, who developed a huge marketing organization, distribution organization of some type, but he was an accountant. And uh, I, uh, you know, I said to myself, how could I have influenced an accountant of all types of people? Uh, now, some accountants are my best friends, understand, but I, I, I don't normally mix with them socially. So, uh, so that was a puzzle uh, to me. Uh, and then, uh, so that was one of the things, because he uh, uh, clearly indicated to me that he only had passing interest in, in, in marketing. And this was the only uh, course that he took in his MBA, in his MBA pro, uh, uh, program. So that was, those were the two major things. Uh, and, and the other thing that he uh, 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 said to me was uh, that he was more interested in the process in the course, in the process in the course, which required him to think about an area that he had very little interest in and how the process in itself interested, got, got him to do the best job that he did. On one other occasion, uh, he was very busy, uh, turned in a piece of work uh, uh, that wasn't his usual style, and uh, when I hand, handed it back to him, I said, you know, gee, I really expected better of you. And uh, he then uh, said to me, he said, I can still see you standing there saying that to me today. He said, whenever I take on a task, I now ask myself, I now ask myself, have I done the best job that I can do? And he says, I see you there all these years later uh, asking me that, that, that question. So th that's what I did. <laughs> and, and it wasn't by uh, design, it just happened. So that's how the chair uh, uh, was named in my name and a bit about this. Now, uh, let me talk to you a bit about uh, the uh, donor and himself. A very quite unusual uh, person. 
and he's not an accountant with the green eye shades, you know, uh, that you still see around every, every, every once in a while, you know, uh, talking about debits and credits all the time. Uh, he's a person who takes college courses for credit, for credit. I wouldn't even attempt to do that. He takes the final exams, the midterm exams. When I first met him, uh, I said to him, uh, can we meet at a certain time? He says, no, I'm, I got to study for my astronomy exam. And I thought, I thought he was kidding. Uh, and uh, I found out later he wasn't kidding. He's a dead serious person. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, he, uh, he took the fi uh, final astronomy exam on this. Uh, he reads widely. Uh, we had an April meeting. Uh, with a couple of the younger faculty here at RIT, and they would mention a book, and he, he would casually say, yes, I've read it, and he would ask them questions about, uh, about, about the book. Uh, uh, he has a, a, a great interest, in, uh, civic interest, in seeing that people uh, don't uh, just accept the sound bites, but they think about it, and they consider it, and they give it some critical thinking when they when they hear the, the sound, uh, sound bites uh, that, they, uh, that uh, are popping up all over the place. So that kind of describes the person that we're, we're dealing with. And I'm proud to say that uh, he and my wife have been, become very good friends of uh, uh, Patty and myself, uh, even to the extent uh, they uh, invited us over to dinner a couple of weeks ago. And we arrived a little early. Uh, and they were preparing the dinner. And what did, what did I see there? Uh, a per chart by, by minute when they're going to put the bread on. <laughs> it was amazing to see. Uh, so uh, they become friends uh, with us. And uh, we have also become friends with Chip. Uh, Chip spent uh, uh, three days, I don't know how he survived it, uh, with us at the end of August talking about what the donor's intent is, and, and uh, we enjoyed that uh, very much and, and enjoyed becoming acquainted with Chip. Now, uh, 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 what in terms of uh, why did he do, uh, why did he pick RIT? Well, he felt the RIT was a, a good place, a uh, starting place, where the chair would motor, be able to motivate faculty to have challenge, to challenge every graduate and undergraduate student to have critical thinking skills when they, when they uh, leave RIT. It would be in their DNA, uh, as, as he saw. Eventually, as uh, President Dessler uh, just indicated, uh, we would hope that RIT eventually would become a center, an international center, uh, for the study and the development of critical thinking, especially uh, for college students and college graduates. All you need to do is pick up the paper and then say, what do college graduates need to have? Interpersonal skills, excuse me, interpersonal skills and critical thinking skills are at the top of every list that you, that, uh, that you uh, see today. So uh, these are the, ho the hopes and, and dreams that we have <coughs> for the chair. Uh, that 10 or 15 years from now, or maybe sooner, if another donor comes along and is so generous, uh, that there would be a center here, probably with a building. Uh, I don't know if you want another building or not. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, hopefully with a building, but at least uh, with a large physical presence of people who are really interested in critical thinking and developing critical thinking. And, uh, and uh, that employers hire uh, RIT graduates because they have uh, the critical thinking skills that, that uh, Bill Gates wants of, of students, that everybody wants of students. So that's the second one. The third one I would like to uh, talk about is what I call the dream weaver, uh, the person who's going to start putting this all together, and that's Dr. Chip uh, Sheffield. And, uh, our uh, uh, the donors' uh, analysis, of, uh, our donors, and my reaction to Chip is, is he's a real Renaissance person who can not only uh, discuss uh, art history, but can uh, discuss venture, uh, venture capital. Uh, Chip holds a BS in philosophy from the University of, of uh, Utah, 
a master's in art history uh, from the University in Colorado, uh, uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, and a PhD uh, in, from uh, Bryn Mawr College. He's been at RIT uh, for since 2003 and is noted for critical thinking. And let me tell you, when we say he knows critical thinking, you don't need to go to a fact checker. Uh, because uh, we have been through all his outlines, the search committee went through all his outlines, his tests, and he really knows what he's doing with critical thinking. So let me turn the podium over uh, to Chip, Dr. Chip Sheffield. Yeah, it's yours, Chip. Gene, thank you so much uh, for those incredibly kind words. Your friendship means a great deal to me, and uh, it's been a delight to get to, to know your family. And uh, I, too, am also immensely grateful to uh, the anonymous donor for having the courage and conviction to, to be so creative in thinking in such a, a position. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Anne Catherine Hales, uh, who will uh, speak tonight and inaugurate uh, the Eugene H. Fram Chair in Applied Critical Thinking. A distinguished professor of literature and director of the graduate program at Duke University, Professor Hales is one of the world's foremost authorities on the interrelation of science, technology, and literature. She is also a leading literary and social critic whose deep and profound insights into electronic literature, gaming, interactive media, cybernetics, the consequences and implications of the relationship between machines and human beings, and the continued relevance and future of the humanities are remarkable. Remarkable in my opinion, for their clarity, their coherence, and lucidity. Above all, Professor Hales is an extraordinary teacher who is deeply invested in her students, as well as an exceptional mentor to younger scholars and colleagues. Her generosity and her kindness are legendary, as is her lambent wit and her nimble always curious intellect. Dr. Hales is no stranger to Rochester. She earned her BS in chemistry at RIT in 1966 and a PhD in English literature at the University of Rochester in 77. In the interval in between, she completed an MS in chemistry at Caltech. She's worked as a research chemist at Xerox and as a research consultant at Beckman Instruments. Uh, before she obtained an MA in English at Michigan State. Her long list of honors, fellowships, prizes, and awards would take up the entire evening. Uh, but some of the most notable include the Renee Relic Prize for the best book in literary theory for 98 uh, 99, for her book How We Became Posthuman, the Suzanne Langer Award for her book Writing Machines, published in 2002. She's also a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship two NEH fellowships, a Rockefeller Residential Fellowship, two Presidential Res uh, Research Fellowships from the University of California, as well as having held the Avenali uh, Chair in the Humanities at UC Berkeley between 2000 and 2001. And that is just a very small drop in the bucket. Professor Hale's presentation today, Our Digital Media Changing the Way We Think, draws upon her latest book, How We Think. Digital Media and Contemporary Technogenesis, which is published at the University of Chicago, 2012. Her talk will be followed by two formal respondents. Uh, they are Dr. Laura Shackelford in our Department of English in the College of Liberal Arts, and Dr. Jessica Lieberman, also uh, from the College of Liberal Arts in the Department of Fine Arts uh, here at RIT. So if you'd please welcome me uh, and a uh, warm uh, um, welcome uh, to Kate Hales. And I guess we need to unmute the projector. The tech person is still home. Here we go. Great, great. Well, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to 
be back here at uh, my alma mater. And as Chip mentioned, I um, graduated from RIT in 1966 in chemistry. And at that time, RIT was a fairly modest enterprise consisting of a few aging buildings in downtown Rochester. And at the time that I graduated, uh, the institute had already bought the land for this campus, but there were no buildings erected as yet. Despite the modesty of the enterprise, I felt that I received a very good education at RIT. I felt I was well prepared for the next steps in my career. But if on the day that I graduated as valedictorian of my class in 1966, I could have been offered a tour of the future and come to see RIT as it is today, I would have been astonished. More than that, I would have been dumbfounded. And it seems to me that the great leap in quality and quantity that RIT has taken from the mid-60s to the present is one of the great success stories of higher education in the later 20th century. And of course, this didn't happen by itself. It happened through the dedication and the hard work of people like Professor Graham and all the other faculty, students, staff, administrators, trustees, donors, and the industry partners who worked hard over many years to make RIT the terrific place it is today. And I invite you to join me in a gesture of gratitude for all of those who contributed. So my talk today is um, based on the new book that I published called um, How We Think, Digital Media and Contemporary Technogenesis. And the bed of this book is that digital media are affecting the way that we think and that increasingly in developed countries like the US, we think through, with, and alongside digital media. Now I need to explain the other term in my title, technogenesis. Technogenesis simply means the coevolution of humans and technical objects. If we were to go back to the Paleolithic period, most paleoanthropologists don't consider this very controversial. They accept, for example, that bipedalism, walking on two feet, co-evolved with the use and transport of tools. That tools conveyed such strong adaptive advantage that it accelerated the development of bipedalism. Bipedalism made it easier to use tools, and so forth. But my argument is that this technogenetic spiral of coevolution didn't end with the Paleolithic period, that it is continuing in the contemporary moment as well. So to flush this argument out, what I'm arguing is not that there is genetic modification as a result of digital media, there may be, but I think that case is unproven right now. But I'm fairly confident that there are epigenetic or environmental effects. In the late 19th century, a man named James Mark Baldwin proposed what he called, what has come to be known as the Baldwin effect. It was essentially arguing that Darwin's theory of natural selection was incomplete. And Baldwin thought about it this way. Let's suppose there's a species which undergoes a mutation, some kind of adaptation. That would go along with Darwin's theory. But then, he said, that species modifies its environment. And it modifies its environment precisely to favor the adaptation of that species has undergone. And that modification of the environment then further favors the adaptation and so forth. So now let's think about a modified Baldwin effect, where that circle is not going through the genetic code, but is going from the environment to the human neurological system. 
And I'll speak in a moment about the plasticity of the neural system. But we know now that the uh, neurology of the human can be modified significantly by environmental influences. And I think that's happening in the present, primarily through the intense engagement with digital media. <clears throat> so to understand how this plasticity of the neurology, neurological system works, we have to say a little bit more about cognition. Now I'm making a distinction here between consciousness, which happens in the neocortex and elsewhere in the forefront of the brain, and cognition, which happens throughout the brain and indeed throughout the central nervous system. So the important point here is that cognition is a much greater uh, faculty than consciousness alone. So cognitive scientists are now talking about what they call the cognitive unconscious. This is very different from the Freudian unconscious. The Freudian unconscious, as we know, dealt with repressed material, suppressed material, and so forth. But the cognitive unconscious is a mental faculty that constantly surveys the environment for information. The amount of information that can be processed through consciousness is a very, very small fraction of all of the information entering our uh, brain. And so it's the cognitive unconscious which does that broader environmental awareness. There's lots of evidence for this, and I'll only give us a few examples. One of these uh, pieces of evidence is called behavioral priming. So I'll give you a couple of examples that come from research done in this area. In one experiment, um, psychiatrists had a group of college students, and uh, they were supposedly being tested for vocabulary. But in fact, one of the vocabulary lists was seeded with synonyms for politeness. The other was seeded for synonyms with rudeness. And then the students left the exam room and there was a stage situation in the corridor to which the students could respond politely or rudely. Those students who had been primed with the politeness synonyms tended predominantly to respond politely. Those on the rude list responded rudely. But it goes much beyond this. People have found that um, if primed with the elderly stereotype, students do less well on memory tests. Not only that, they walk slower. So we can sort of understand this as an adaptive behavior that responds to the environment and unconsciously modifies the environment to bring the person closer into step with their environment. But if we are, as humans, this sensitive in ways we don't even recognize consciously to the environment, that means that if our environment changes to a dense digital infrastructure, that infrastructure can affect us on ways that we're not even conscious of. And that's exactly what I think is happening uh, at present. So Nigel Thrift, a British geographer, has um, talked about how our sense of space and time are being influenced by things like GPS technologies, pervasive computing within the environment, ubiquitous computing and so forth, RFID tags. And he's called uh, this kind of dense infrastructure the technological unconscious. That is the ways in which we respond to our technological environment in these uh, sedimented structures that he calls the technological unconscious. So now we have some kind of sense of what uh, this extended sense of cognition is and how it might be affecting us in our everyday uh, interactions. But it would be helpful to have some more specific examples of how digital media are impacting us and particularly 
our young people. So a few years ago, when I had the um, honor of being a Phi Beta Kappa scholar, I had as part of my charge to visit universities, colleges across the country, and I was struck by the fact that everywhere I want, went, I heard people saying the same thing. I can't get my students to read novels anymore, so I've taken to assigning short stories. I can't get them to read whole books, so now I assign chapters of books. And on doing some further reading, it seemed to me that we were in the midst of a shift in cognitive modes, and that this shift was the greater, the younger, the cohort we were talking about. So I see it now in my college students, but you go to 12-year-olds and you would really see it. And what does this shift consist of? Well, in broad terms, it consists of a shift from what we might call deep attention to hyperattention. In deep attention, a mode kind of native to the humanities, the preference is to focus on a single object for a long period of time, to shut out external stimuli. So if you're reading a Dickens novel, for example, you just don't even hear what's going around you, a quality that used to drive my mother crazy when I was a child, uh, and so forth. What is hyperattention? Hyperattention is a desire for increased stimulation, the ability to shift flexibly and quickly between different information streams, and a, a relatively low threshold for boredom. Now, why would we begin to see something like this shift in uh, cognitive modes? Well, here now I can go a bit more into depth on what I mean by neuroplasticity. So neurologists have known for a long time that when an infant is born, at birth, that child has more synapses, that is, connections between neurons, than he or she will ever have again in uh, his or her life. And during the first weeks and months of life, those synapses are pruned. The ones that are stimulated by the environment spread and grow, those that are not used by the environment shrink and disappear. Far from this being a tragedy of an infant losing its synapses, no, it's a wonderful adaptive mechanism to make sure that every infant has its brain re-engineered at birth, at birth to fit its environment. So if that infant is growing up in a technological society such as our own, from birth on, its neural structure is literally being re-engineered to fit the environment. And as that environment includes more and more digital media, digital media begin to have a greater and greater impact on what the actual neural structure will be. So now let's go to neuroplasticity. It's usually divided into three different kinds, developmental. So uh, synaptogenesis would be an example of in, uh, developmental plasticity. Synaptic modulation. Even as an older adult, my synapses are still responding to my environment. That's an example of synaptic modulation. And reparative, that's where someone suffers some kind of brain injury, like a stroke or so forth, and begins to rearrange his neurology by using different neural nets than he used originally. So people who have a stroke can't use their arm, but then they learn to use their arm in, by using different brain circuits as time goes on. Now, we've sort of been talking so far about the human part of this coevolutionary spiral. Let's now switch for a moment to go to the technical or technical objects part. One of the theorists who is useful to think about this uh, strain is Gilbert Simondon, a French um, theorist and technician who was writing in the 1950s and 1960s in France. He invented a title for himself, Mechanologist. And uh, Simon Don's writing is useful because Simon Don did not think of technical objects as static entities. They're made, they're manufactured, you put them on the shelf, that's what they are. 
Rather, Simon Don conceptualized technical objects as always on their way to something else. And to kind of capture that idea, he used the terminology abstract and concrete. Concrete is a fully realized technological object that has, so to speak, reached its potential. A hammer would be an example of that. You can't do much more with a hammer. A hammer is a hammer. But uh, he also thought at the other end of that scale were abstract objects that had not yet reached their potential and had tremendous reservoir of potentiality for future development. The digital computer could be an example of a highly abstract technology. So through this kind of terminology, Simon Don postulated that objects weren't stable, they were only <coughs> metastable. They only had reached a provisional point of uh, development that always could be developed further, except for those that were at the most concrete end of the spectrum. So in this way, he imagined that objects are undergoing a constant evolution in a similar way to human beings. So now we have a way to match up the evolution of technical objects with the neuroplasticity of humans to begin putting the technogenetic spiral into, um, into play. So, um, we can sum all this up by saying that we make technical objects and technical objects make us. And that this is a process continuing into the present. So what is this trajectory that we seem to be on with digital uh, objects and contemporary technogenesis? I think it's not difficult to see the general trend of this trajectory. First of all, it means increased information density. So now we not only have many more sources from which to get information, CNN online, not just CNN on TV and so forth, but the pace at which information is coming to us seems to be going faster and faster and faster. We see increased use of multitasking, especially among young people. Now, multitasking is actually a bit of a misnomer. Studies have shown that what we actually do is focus on one object at a time, but what we call multitasking is a quick alternation of focus on a whole bunch of different objects. And that, I think, is endemic in the way that, for example, college students study for exams now, college students write their papers and so forth. They're not just sitting there in the library with a pen and paper, no. They've got their computer on, they've got a chat window open, they're maybe looking at their email at the same time. All this is happening concurrently. An increased pace of reading and absorption. So I think that part of uh, the gift of hyperattention is to be able to absorb information more and more quickly. There have been studies of how people read web pages, for example, uh, through the Nielsen group. And this uh, study uses eye tracking plus oral uh, narration by the subjects. And what they found is that when someone starts reading a web page, they read all the way across the page. But as they go down on the page or the screen, the line lengths get shorter and shorter, and then by the bottom, they're simply reading down the left margin. Therefore, the worst place to put important information is on the bottom right corner, in case you happen to be designing any web pages recently. But what this means is this kind of hyper skimming now becomes endemic in the way young people especially absorb information. There are more and more intelligent environments as computers move out of the desktop into mobile technologies, into smartphones, into various kinds of web appliances. But not only that, the environment itself is becoming more intelligent with embedded devices, RFID tags, and so forth. 
There are faster and faster cycles of innovation, which of course we're all aware of in the area of digital technologies. And this means as the process of innovation gets faster, that human attention becomes the bottleneck through which information has to pass. And as an inevitable result of that, we get increased machine-machine communication. So now human attention is at the top of a pyramid. Many, many layers deep in that pyramid are machines talking to machines. So when you open your cell phone and it says searching for signal, it's actually making handshakes with various kinds of uh, repeating towers and so forth. All machine, machine communication underneath the awareness of human consciousness who's merely looking at that screen and seeing a simple message. But that's only one example. The internet itself is another great example of machine-machine communication. So this has um, benefits. It also has limitations or drawbacks. It's perhaps obvious why hyperattention would have drawbacks as well as benefits. One of the people who's thought about this is Catherine Malibu, a French theorist who recently published a book called What Should We Do With Our Brain? And Malibu covers in her book many of the issues of neuroplasticity that I've uh, been talking about, the ability of the brain to, to adapt. But she also urges us toward what we might call critical thinking. And she notices that the ability to adapt is one of the demands of the contemporary workplace. And maybe for many workers, not a good demand, because it means a lot of job insecurity. It means you can be fired without notice, and so on and so forth. So Malibu issues a challenge to us as a critical thinker. What should we do so that consciousness of the brain does not purely and simply coincide with the spirit of capitalism. In other words, as critical thinkers, how can we resist or critically interrogate this tendency toward flexibility? And so she makes a strong distinction between plasticity and flexibility. Flexibility is a response to the demands of the workplace Plasticity is an inherent capacity of the brain to adapt to change situations. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, she's also aware that consciousness is just at the tip, but there's all these other levels of the cognitive unconscious and the non-conscious below that. And she locates the capacity for resistance in the gap of, or the rupture between the narrating or autobiographical self, that is consciousness, and what Tony Damasio has called the proto-self, that level below consciousness where thoughts are just beginning to come into awareness. And she suggests that it's this proto-self that should be the focus of our attempts at resistance and critical thinking. Now, as you can see, there's a problem with this argument. And the problem is this. The proto-self, by definition, is below consciousness. How can we access it or activate it in a spirit of resistance if we can't consciously direct our minds to do so? This, I think, is where digital media have a positive role to play that through digital media we can invent devices and, and digital objects that address all levels of embodied cognition, including the conscious, the unconscious, and the non-conscious. So from here I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I've been engaged in for the last year in the Greater Than Games Lab at Duke University. So the Greater Than Games Lab is a project that uh, attempts to mobilize games for socially constructive purposes. And my particular project was creating an alternate reality game. An alternate reality game is a game that plays across real life, digital, 
and online platforms. So it isn't invested in any of those, it plays against all of them. But my particular interest was in being able to form a game that would link neural transformation with pedagogical goals. In other words, enlist the plasticity of the brain, but now in a directed way to uh, try to achieve a purpose. But not only to enlist it, to also be able to envision new goals and to create links between all levels of embodied awareness. Well, this is obviously a very tall order. Uh, and I and two colleagues and then a team of about 12 other people worked very hard last spring to create an alternate reality game called Speculation. And here I have to say a little bit about how I became interested in finance capital. Prior to 2008, it wasn't even on my radar. But in 2008, I thought I lost a third of my life savings in the crisis. And believe me, that got my attention. So uh, as an academic, I decided, OK, I need to know much more about this. I need to know much more about what caused this crisis, what were the underlying forces, how could I locate myself in relation to it. And that was my motive for getting involved in this alternate reality game. And it has as its uh, motives, where are we here? Why have we lost the uh, images? Somehow this has gone way off the screen. All right, so I'll have to tell you the backstory of speculation. So uh, the backstory of speculation is this, that um, we positioned it in a near future world in which the Euro has collapsed and with it the Eurozone. The whole time we were working on the game, we were terrified that the Euro would collapse and our near future world would become the present world. And in our near future dystopic world, a coalition of investment banks and powerful corporations gotten together to form a kind of uh, uber corporation called Metacorp. And it has offered to bail the world out, but at the cost of taking control of the financial system, much as the World Bank does now with uh, third world countries. And so a resistance group has arisen to try to wrest control back to democratic organizations. And this resistance group uh, goes by the name of NEX, N-E-X. Actually, it was meant to be called NEXT, but somehow the T got lost in a typo. So it became NEX. Um, so the way that we structured this game was through eight different modules that explored uh, these topics. So what comes before naturalization of credit is credit default swaps, and then you see the other topics covered by these modules. And the game was massive in its content, and it, con it contained a lot of historical information about the origins of money, how, how did people come to believe money was worth something, the state violence that accompanied the establishment of credit instruments and so forth. Um, and it um, was meant to um, connect the dots. We're losing some of the screen there for reasons I don't understand. But it involved uh, embodied components, uh, subconscious recognitions, collaborative play, and it was a transmedial production across virtual, online, and real world uh, locations. So the structure of the game was like this. And what you see here are the different hubs for the module. So each module had multiple levels in it. So you progress from the hub of, near, of level one through level two and so forth. And in between the modules or the hubs was a narrative component. The narrative component was constructed as next being interrogated, uh, had been caught and was now in the process of being interrogated by a Metacorp uh, employee. 
And so you would play through the game, playing one level of uh, the first level and the first hub of all the modules, second uh, hub, and so forth. And the connection that we hoped to make was between the narrative and uh, the gameplay. Now I have to say that as a teacher, I had a vision of how this game would be played. And it would involve this, the gamers going through all of the historical material, acquiring uh, dense information about our present situation, but also about the whole history of money and so forth. And um, this fall, I convened a group of five bright undergraduates, terrific gamers, naive about finance capital, so my perfect, my perfect test group. And um, I discovered that the way they played the game was nothing at all like I thought it was going to be played. You know, one of those teacherly moments when you realize that your students are actually doing something completely different than you thought they were doing. And in general, what they were doing was inventing all kinds of shortcuts that took them through the game much more quickly but had the effect of cutting off the connections with all of the historical and informational material I had hoped they would gain. So you could say that this project was a failure, or at least a, only a partial success, in, a, in achieving its goals. Nevertheless, we had about 3,000 players from 33 countries participate in uh, the length of time that it was on. And um, they seemed to enjoy the game. We had a final event, which was a chat session with Nex. Um, and they were pretty good about getting all of the nuances and the complexities we built into the narrative. But I think in the end, they learned only a small about, about finance capital, which of course was one of the principal goals of the game. So right now, we're in the process of redesigning the game to make the connections between the narrative material and the historical material much stronger, much clearer. We thought we were being terribly subtle. It turned out we were being so subtle we missed the point. Uh, so we need to make the, the game more obvious, the clues more obvious. The game has a lot of cryptographic puzzles in it. Things like an audio file, which is actually a Morse code transmission, but played backward. So as a gamer, you have to put it into an audio program, and then you have to reverse it, and then you get the Morse code, and then you have to take it to a Morse code converter to get the message. Or another example, we had an image, descrim an image scrambler, which took an image and uh, divided it up line by line, pixel by line of pixels, and then scramble them in random order. You had to go to an image to scrambler, get it, the image to scrambler through an evolutionary algorithm program to match the lines up again and get some semblance of the original image back. These were just some of the puzzles that we built into the game, um, but as I say, it was only a partial success. So the game is launching again uh, right now. And if you'd like to join in the fun, you can find it at speculation.net, where instead of the I in speculation, you put a one. And that takes you to an initial narrative, which we hope will be intriguing, and then to all the modules that you can play through. And we're encouraging collaborative play, so if you get stuck on any one puzzle or uh, part of the game, you'll have lots of comrades playing the game with you, who can give you good hints and uh, help you along in the game. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you for your attention. to the new book, um, Dr. Hales sort of points to several shifts um, in contemporary scholarly and 
um, intellectual production and circulation um, and connects them in a really nice sort of concise mapping. So she points to shifts this kind of turn to problem-based inquiry, um, the use of computation-based methods in academia, uh, collaborative interdisciplinary research, um, as well as undergraduate research, and um, really concisely illustrates how all these are related to this broader shift in modes of academic production in relation to digital media. Um, I was thinking during your talk, um, in thinking about the relationship between digital media and traditional humanities, um, scholarship, and teaching, um, I think Kate Hales's book and her talk today are just a wonderful kind of proof of concept um, about what the digital humanities can provide. Um, one of many, of course, approaches. Um, so I think during her talk, you can see Dr. Hales combining research results and methodologies from cognitive science, um, psychology, and neuroscience, all drawing from all those fields to think through this question of attention. Um, she provides insights into technological change, uh, drawing from uh, science studies, cultural anthropology, and also um, philosophy of technology. Um, as a literary scholar, I have to appreciate that she also brings into this mix um, uh, literary and artistic explorations of these questions um, and thinks about how they you know, both add to the way we think about these questions, but also um, make us more self-conscious and aware of some of those issues, as she describes it. Um, and then lastly, Dr. Hales, I think today and in her work, directly connects um, these questions to the question I think that most, I would say most, many academics are asking today is what are we, what are we as scholars and intellectuals supposed to do <laughs> about some of these shifts? Um, how are we to, as she puts it, intervene in the technogenetic spiral? Um, the effect of this approach, I think this sort of multidisciplinary, multidimensional approach um, to the question of attention in Hale's talk, um, really, really changes the way we think about some of these questions in some crucial ways. So I know when I hear the word attention these days, and obviously because I'm a teacher, um, probably because I've watched too much uh, bad news, <laughs> um, but attention immediately brings to mind for me things like people increasingly running into stationary objects, <laughs> uh, texting while driving, um, and then also the just perennial problem of um, a lack of attention in classrooms. Um, and I think um, what's really wonderful about um, Hales' multidisciplinary approach um, is the way in which um, she complexifies the way we think about attention um, and that it directly contributes to new possibilities for intervening, engaging students' attention, um, thinking about the role that attention plays um, in our reading practices and in our lives. Um, I note that this complexity facilitates um, an adept reframing of technological and social changes um, that are also often feared and divisive. Um, and so I think it's really important that we change the way we ask these questions um, so we don't fall back into the sort of reactionary responses um, to some of these shifts. Um, and also, you know, follow, I think, Dr. Hales' lead in seeing this as an opportunity. I mean, it's really an immense opportunity to rethink educational practices, to rethink, you know, basic concepts such as attention that we might think we understand, um, but clearly there's a lot um, at least in terms of the new research in uh, non-conscious and unconscious attention. Um, there are a lot of dimensions to something as basic as attention that we just don't understand. All right, so I had two questions um, for you, Dr. Hales, and they're both kind of requests for really to hear a little bit more about what you eloquently describe as technogenetic processes through which um, we make technologies and technologies make us. And I'm curious in particular in hearing more about how you think they unfold in the contemporary social field um, and what this means for how we might pursue um, as scholars, as citizens, as students, um, certain kinds of technogenetic interventions such as the wonderful alternate reality game um, that you pointed to. Um, so the first question is just uh, to hear, I was curious what the importance is of understanding the evolutionary dimensions to these processes. So why does that matter? 
um, to think about technological change as a part of evolutionary change or related to it. Um, also, in light of those evolutionary processes, uh, does technogenesis require distinct strategies that are cognizant of evolution's tendency to work through methods of bootstrapping, adaptation, uh, environmental pressures, and provisionality as opposed to a kind of top-down engineering? That's a common distinction uh, that neuroscientists, philosophers, and biologists make about evolution is it wasn't designed you know, wholesale overnight, it had to be sort of built up over time. So I'm wondering if that impacts how we can intervene in these processes. Um, and then the second question, and these are kind of, you know, you can answer both and or either or, they're optional. <laughs> uh, the second question is just in talking about this technogenetic feedback, feedback loop between technical beings and living beings, you illustrate how, quote, this is from chapter four of your book, uh, both groups change together in coordinated and indeed synergistic ways, end quote. Uh, I think you really eloquently describe those relays. Um, but what I was interested in hearing a little bit more about from you is why we then see such discrepancies between um, different kinds of literacies today, um, conflicts between digital born scholars and print um, based scholars, um, and even I've had a similar experience teaching digital games in the classroom and realizing as my students were up playing a game, um, realize, realizing that I was actually the illiterate <laughs> in the room. So I'm just kind of curious about how, how you can explain some of those discrepancies um, in relation to this broader process and whether there's an issue of social power, cultural authority that enters into RIT's strengths in the fields of science, technology, engineering, gaming, and mechanics have long fostered an environment that respects practical application in its pedagogy, foregrounding problem-based inquiry, project-based research, and experiential learning. On this techno-savvy scene, humanistic inquiry at RIT has thrived, in part by making fruitful use of emerging technologies such as digital media, to reinvigorate and redirect its base principles and methods, and to motivate new avenues of interrogation. Furthermore, as Dr. Hale suggests, the interventions offered herein are certainly pedagogical, resulting in courses and curricula that are adaptive and timely, but also constructive in the world at large, putting forth students and projects that are not only cutting edge in their technology, but also intellectually prepared to engage with the social, political, economic, psychological, and philosophical dilemmas of contemporary society. At its best, RIT's humanities and qualitative social sciences are ahead of the curve in their recognition of the deeply imbricated and symbiotic relationship of humanity and machine, 
cognition and tools, attention and materiality. At RIT today, faculty who research in the digital humanities collaborate across disciplines and colleges to develop these kinds of comparative media programming at all levels. Freshman level courses such as Imagining Rochester, which teaches comparative reading modalities, such as the triad of close, hyper, and machine reading that Hales crystallizes. Minors, such as visual culture, housed in the fine arts department, and digital literature and comparative media, housed in the English department, each understand its principal media as constituted by, in, and through digital media. Majors, such as the newly crafted Digital Humanities Program, born of a collaboration of over 30 faculty members, three colleges, and the university press and libraries. And finally, NEH proposals for graduate programs such as integrating societal complexities into geospatial support for disaster management, produced by faculty from four colleges and spanning seven disciplines. For many complicated reasons, however, academia, and RIT along with it, remains siloed into distinct disciplines and requires research of its faculty and curricula, curricula for its students that emphasize disciplinary distinctiveness. One question I have for Dr. Hales then is programmatic. This is some of Dr. Hales' language from her most recent book. How might an institution ripe with pockets of digital humanities inquiry and even blessed with cross-disciplinary collaborations that reflect your discussion of historical, contemporary, and future comparative media studies. Expand or reorganize structurally so as to further emphasize the necessity and gains of such a dialogic and dialectical aspect as the technogenetic spiral. To use your own words, how might an institution such as RIT develop courses, curricula, programs, or centers that function like your technical objects as temporary coalescences in fields of conflicting and cooperating forces? The next thread I would like to pull is a disciplinary one. When I listed some of the disciplines that make RIT strong and technogenetically sophisticated, the disciplines of the arts were not noted. As a scholar of visual culture, my bias is towards the visual. And as faculty at RIT, I know that it is in the visual and performing arts that some of our most provocative interventions into the digital humanities are being made. Thus, I would like to add a fourth term to your triad of reading modalities. Again, close, hyper, and machine reading. Aesthetic reading. My next question then is rather a provocation. A provocation to track the opportunity for the technogenetic spiral to join aesthetics in animating academic discourses in a positively, productively, destabilizing way. Briefly and for examples, in the realm of philosophy, your elaboration of technical objects provides a riveting counterpoint to Immanuel Kant's diagnosis of the condition for beauty. Kantian aesthetics turned on a perceived paradox of art, the idea of purposiveness without purpose, or intentionally produced, though produced to have no intention. Dr. Hale's assessment of tools and their role as catalysts for change, cognitive and material, open up provocative new avenues for Kantian notions of beauty and the sublime, as well as for Cartesian notions of perspective in our criticism. The opportunities for social, political, and economic impact have been addressed already in Dr. Shackelford's questions, but these two are critical spaces opened up by the bringing together of human and machine-centered views. In the fields of art history and criticism, scholars such as James Bridle, Bruce Sterling, Ian Bogos, and Matthew Battles work on what they call the new aesthetics, providing powerful examples that correspond with your discussion of embodied material objects. In their formulation, we are using aesthetics to wave at machines. We are learning to wave at them, and they are beginning to wave back in earnest. 
So those were examples from uh, the world of fashion. Uh, the term used to refer to the appearance of visual language of digital technology in the internet, in the physical world, as well as the blending of the physical and virtual. So this is an eruption of the digital, uh, reveling in seeing the grain of computation in the aesthetic realm. These images illustrate this idea. These are uh, works of art by various artists um, made out of plywood, sculptures in Vancouver, um, an orca by Douglas Copeland, large structural sculptures. These are a variety of pieces, architectural and painting pieces, that are made to work off both the idea of pixelization and digitization in the aesthetic architectural scene, and also the use of Google Maps as a new way of perceiving our world, unlike good old-fashioned Cartesian perspective. And this, on the other hand, is in fact a not work of art, but a NASA satellite image revealing actual agricultural patterns from space. And yet now we read it as if it were a work of art. <coughs> Finally, your extension of the notions of neuroplasticity and the adaptive unconscious provide fertile ground for a final provocation. In your article, Traumas of Code, you take these theoretical moves to the practical level of psychological trauma and human suffering. Visual culture participates in shifting the discourse of vision as unmediated towards one that is photographic. The photographic image <coughs> mediates our vision, structures it, and co-substantiates it, and vice versa. So bringing your evolutionary discourse of adaptive technology to the realm of the unconscious, you proffer code as the correlate unconscious to language. As someone whose work tackles trauma and the visual, and who works with notions of unconsciousness and code in the linguistic theory of semiotics, I wonder how you might bring the discourses of digital code and human language to the realm of visual imagery and human experience. and then we can um, turn it over to you. So um, Laura asked uh, what we can do when we become aware that digital media are having these kinds of effects on us. And there are two um, prominent responses. One is the response that Nicholas Carr records in his book, The Shallows, where Carr is essentially noticing the same thing I was talking about, hyperattention although he doesn't call it that. He might call it attention deficit instead. And uh, Carr is bemoaning this effect. And he writes very eloquently about the day that he decided to turn off his computer, to go in the other room, to pick up a book, to not worry about email, and just to spend a leisurely day or two days immersing himself in that book. And I have to say that I've had the same experience of turning off my computer, going to the other room, picking up a profound book like Quentin Mayasu's After Finitude, and just enjoying the challenge of that book. And I think there's a place for that. But um, as busy professionals, there are limits to how many times we can turn off our email and uh, retreat to the other room and uh, let the world go by however it would. The other response is the one that I was exploring in speculation, and that is to um, you, 
use the poison as the cure. So if digital media are the poison in the sense that they're affecting our, our attention span, then to try to create a game that would um, go into digital media and make its intervention in that way. Um, another sort of dilemma that's often posited for us that Laura alluded to is our humanists who feel that the digital is a threat. People who were raised with print, immersed in print, have their skills uh, based in print uh, methodologies, and who see the digital as a threat to their competency, to their uh, professional authority, and so forth. So very often we get this we get this parsed as the digital versus the print. That you are either on the side of print, like Burkitt's is, or else you are on the side of the digital and then you think print is going to become obsolete. What I observe is quite the opposite. What I observe is a burst of creativity in the print medium in response to the digital. Writers who are taking the digital sort of as the images Jessica showed of the pixelated shoes and the pixelated models and so forth, taking it as a challenge and an opportunity to rethink the print medium and to begin to explore the unexplored potential of the print book as a media. Now that has disciplinary consequences. As Jessica alluded to, universities unfortunately tend to be siloed where you have people operating in their disciplines and not talking to people in other disciplines. RIT I think is a great exception to that, but that's pervasive in academia. Um, and so I think that a move forward in this direction is to start from my home discipline, literature, and begin to think about literature not as a print medium, uh, but that print itself is a medium. And so a collaborator and I are, at the moment, editing a collection of essays called A New Paradigm for the Humanities Comparative Textual Studies, in which we put together essays on the scroll or the book roll, the medieval manuscript, the Renaissance handwriting, on up into computer games, and put them all together to explore commonalities and differences between these different media. So recognizing that print is a medium opens the door to thinking about it in relation to all the other media, including uh, visual media. And I think that's a way to overcome that tendency to silo within distinct disciplines and begin to reconceptualize how curricula are formulated. Um, the typical uh, way curricula are formulated in English departments, for example, is through periods. You have 18th century prose, for example, 19th century novel. Uh, through, uh, through countries, so you have British, you have American, etc., and through genre. And I think those categories are obsolete. I think we should uh, go back to the drawing board and begin to think about curricula based on comparative media studies, where we now uh, take the media uh, medium platform as an opportunity for interrogation and construct courses and curriculum. So um, that's a very discipline-specific answer, but uh, since Laura and I are both in English well, literature departments, we can have this disciplinary conversation. So I would like to thank them and also welcome everyone now to join the conversation in whatever way you would like. Yes, question?
desire of people, too many people, to stay connected. They seem to be lost if they're not connected through the digital screen. And I, I find it sometimes amusing and sometimes worrisome. It goes from texting in cars to people talking to each other in high school corridors. Why are people so intensely concerned about being connected? Why can't we just sit quiet for a moment? <laughs> Well, thank you for that question. I don't know if everyone was able to hear it, but basically he was, the gentleman was commenting on something we probably all noticed, how young people stay glued to their smartphones and uh, no matter where they are, they're walking through the forest and there they are texting on their smartphones. Um, well, I think that probably the human species was always uh, drawn to information. And now that information is more available than ever, um, it becomes a very powerful attractant that we could think of the human species, species as infovores. They always uh, want more information. And the one thing that anthropologists notice about human societies, including tribal societies, is that the most popular activity across all societies is gossip and social connections. And so you combine information technologies with gossip and social connections, and you have a almost fatal attraction there for, for humans. So on the question of what to do about this, I think there is a real problem uh, with getting lost in the real world through the attachment to the screen. And some of my colleagues at Duke are working on projects that I think Jessica also alluded to of combining virtual uh, overlays and real place um, locations to kind of do a geospatial annotation of uh, what you're actually looking like, its history, its context, etc. That at least has the, has the benefit of bringing the real world um, connected to the screen. That sort of is another uh, example of using digital media to try to intervene in this situation. I suspect it's absolutely useless to tell people, leave your smartphone at home. While Chip's walking over there, I will just let you know, if you are a Rochesterian, there's an artist duo named Eco Art Tech out of the University of Rochester. <coughs> We're actually doing one for the Rochester area. And the idea is that you do do play it on your smartphone, but as you're wandering around the Rochester environment, it sends you back to the real world and asks questions that force you to put it down and look around you and interact. Hi, um, I'm, I'm curious, I just want to make sure I understand what you mean by technogenesis. Um, you know, I remember reading a study a while ago that taxi cab drivers on campus became very sophisticated and um, uh, through, a, through a process of neuroplasticity, but uh, you know, because they, they navigate all the time. But there's no suggestion that the genetics of the population of taxi cab drivers is changing as a result of this. So, am I so understand that what you're really talking about is that we're kind of bypassing the genetic code and the technology is transmitting changes from one generation to the next? Yes, that is what I was proposing. It may be that in the long term there will be genetic effects or at least some kind of genetic drift, but I, um, I'm, I'm unable to find any convincing evidence for that at the present. So what I was suggesting was that these adaptations were happening through a combination of environmental influences and neuroplasticity. That is, it's not going through the genetic code. It's going through changes in brain structure after birth in relation to the environment. Uh, I think there is beginning to be a little evidence about uh, how the epigenetic and the genetic might relate in this regard. But I think that those kind of studies are still in their infancy.
I have more of a, a proposal that I'd like to hear your feedback on rather than a question that I'd like answered. Um, I would like everyone to think about, rather than finding a way to get everyone to put down their phones um, and come back to real life, I would like to think of a way to get the information to people that they want through their phone, but get it to them without their phones so that we can still get the, both, the, best, the best of both worlds. People won't be staring at their phones when they should be driving, but they'll still get those social connections and gossip that they crave. Um, what do you think about that kind of direction? And how would they get the information without the smartphone? <laughs> Science fiction writer William Gibson imagines that in the near future there will be neural implants where you just kind of jack a device into your brain and suddenly you, you, you know all about art history, for example. Um, that seems to me uh, very much a science fiction fantasy because knowing art history is much more than just having the information. It involves context and uh, all these other things. So. I think your proposal is intriguing, but I guess to have a reaction, I'd have to know what the mechanism is. Another example, I guess, would be uh, putting hands-free devices built into your car so you don't have to hold the phone or push buttons you can ask your car to call for employee. <laughs> I think we're close to that now. Um, well, part of the problem, of course, with cell phones and driving is not only that you're using your hand when you should be driving, but also the question of what you're focusing on. So I, I don't think that uh, putting the cell phone on an automatic play in a car would solve that particular problem. So, um, kind of touching on that and what you said earlier, there's a distinction between access to and absorption of information and actually understanding it and doing something with that. Um, so. How do you see that distinction and where we're heading with that and how digital media affects that? So the question is, the difference between understanding and being absorbed in something, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, this is where the issue of critical thinking was coming in, isn't it? So if you are absorbing something, you're not necessarily thinking critically about it. You're simply reacting to it or you're being impacted about it. And I think that it's really important for students, for example, who enjoy playing computer games, to think about designing computer games. And when they think about designing it, then they go from the uh, reactive mode into the proactive mode, where they actually begin thinking about, what do I want to accomplish with this game? How can the design help me achieve that accomplishment? And so forth. So I think what, um, Jessica and Laurel were both talking about uh, integrated and experiential learning is a really important component here when we think about the impact on students taking them from a passive mode into an active mode where they're actually in control of producing things and then in that way can bring critical thinking to bear. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, Relative to brain plasticity and the game that you developed, um, it was too bad a lot of people took shortcuts. And they really didn't go down into the depths of derivatives and collaterals and all that stuff. I'm just curious when you look at the front of the lobe and the front of the lower cortex as it operate, you know, left side, right side, you know, that theory of, of, of neurology. Um, did you find anything in within that game? or did you measure at all the effects that it may have had on the hippocampus uh, of, the, of the brain in general? Because whether you're in a digital world or analog or as you're crossing over between them, your hippocampus is going to remain central to that. And I'm just curious if you saw anything that, that developmentally in that way, it, it either enhanced, increased the capacity of the hippocampus within the brain. Uh, well, I'm not uh, well versed in the medical literature, so I can't respond specifically to the hippocampus and its role in, um, in gaming and so forth. But uh, there are a couple 
couple of books that I can mention on, on a related subject. One is um, by James G., who has a spirit of defense of computer games, arguing that computer games teach practical and valuable skills. Um, and then the other uh, book I could mention is by Stephen Jones called Everything That's Bad For You Is Good For You. And uh, so he talks about pop culture, TV series, computer games, and so forth. And essentially, his argument boils down to saying that in popular culture, we've seen um, an increase in complexity, nuance, and interconnection. So he uses um, sitcoms from the 1960s where you had a linear plot line and, you know, A followed B followed C to uh, the late 90s and the 2000s where we get multiple plot lines intertwining and complexities between them and so forth to argue basically that our entertainment is getting um, more complex and that our IQs are increasing as a result. So he talks about the Flynn effect, uh, where um, some studies suggest that starting in about uh, 1960, 1970, there was an unexplained jump in IQ. And his argument is that our more complex entertainments were a direct result of this jump in IQ. Yeah, what, what I was looking at with the uh, relative to the hippocampus was, hippocampus is your memory and you know dementia alzheimer's and you've got this whole new digital technology now that this these new generations are going to come through now it'll be curious to see in the long run what effects that has on that facility of the brain uh relative to you know today we we, we study alzheimer's and, and those related diseases with proteins and enzymes and, and those effects are having the brain but it should be interesting over time to see how this media affects uh, the memory recall of the hippocampus and doesn't enlarge it, enhance it, you know, and make it better, uh, whether it's genetic or not, you know, it's probably just by way of stimulation. That, yeah, I think there have been some, some studies showing that uh, dementia can be helped with increased brain activity. <laughs> Um, so the Japanese, for example, want their elders to do Sudoku on a daily basis and so forth. Um, and if we can extrapolate rather irresponsibly from that result, we, we could say that increased information density should actually help um, things like dementia. At the same time, the issue of memory is uh, complex and uh, distributed. So increasingly, when I was in graduate school, we were supposed to have everything inside our heads, and uh, you were expected to have an encyclopedic command of uh, your subject. Now that's completely changed, and increasingly it's recognized that external memory uh, is a valuable resource and supplements and extends internal memory, and it's perfectly acceptable to extend your memory through prosthetic means like digital media. I think we have time for maybe one last question. If there's <coughs> someone who can't wait. During the development of your um, your game, did you or any of your team research Kurt Squire and see any of the uh, educational video game research that he's published about? I, I know you mentioned a few other authors, but I didn't hear his name come up. Um, I don't think so. We were so busy trying to create the game that we didn't have an opportunity to do that kind of research, but we're sort of returning to it this fall. And thank you for the reference. I'll check on that. Like. Um, Kate, thank you for, uh, for revisiting us. Uh, um, you've been generous in coming back for a number of occasions. And uh, a couple of years ago, we, we held a conference here and spoke on the future of reading. 
Uh, and, and I'm curious, uh, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the responses to digital media have been uh, um, to sort of put down the phone, right, and, and go find the book. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you might, uh, uh, what, what, what you might prescribe in terms of writing, uh, not so much in terms of reading off the screen, but what, what sorts of activities in terms of composition uh, would you like to see integrated into the curriculum uh, for our students as they move forward in the next five years or ten years? Well, this is a topic that I've thought a lot about. How, how might we change our writing instruction and our writing practices? And um, I think the days of requiring students to write paper essays are limited. Uh, some teachers may still require that. But increasingly, I think the tendency now is to go to multimedia composition that uses a variety of animation, video clips, along with prose and so forth, and to craft um, well-developed projects. So these really aren't called essays anymore. They're projects, and they're often collaborative rather uh, than single. So I think uh, that's uh, a growing trend in composition studies in particular. I very much think it's a good trend. At the same time, I think we want to hold on to traditional humanistic strengths. So the idea that writing and reading well are central to any kind of professional career remains, I think, as true now as it has ever been, maybe even truer and that we need to make sure that our students have strong print literacy as well as strong digital literacy. Print literacy, no, I think, is not sufficient for the future of our students, but at the same time, it remains crucial. So now the challenge for us as teachers is how to achieve both of these goals at once when it seems hard even to get print literacy, but. Uh, I think there are lots of innovative ways to do that, and I'd like to invite you to comment on this, because you both. I guess just from my own experience, one possible way of approaching that without, I'm very invested in writing, um, but without sort of, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, I've designed a narrative across media class, and so we take basic concepts of narrative from literary theory, um, we begin with short stories, but then we move to uh, graphic novels, digital games, and so forth. And that's, at least in my personal experience teaching, a really productive way to sort of both sort of ground uh, that exploration in print cultures and in humanistic traditions, but also explore in a really creative, interesting way how those assumptions are changed, challenged in really interesting ways by these different practices. You know, what does interactivity in a digital game add to how we understand storytelling and so forth. So that's just one, I mean, that would be one example I would give. Jessica. Yeah, my, my students are snickering at me right now in the room, but my classes are all project-based, but they're also project portfolio-based. So you do need to write print uh, material, but then that develops into the next level, develops into the next level. So we then move into more interactive and digital kinds of technologies, even if that's uh, interactive, can just be oral presentations as well. So it comes together in a larger portfolio model, but the thing that I laugh at time after time is that the students often come back saying, a paper would have just been easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely difficult to get yourself across, and so often, even if they do a rather sort of collaborative, creative project, they end up doing a written statement explaining, so they know that I know exactly what they did. Uh, I think this is a superb way in which to end and conclude. Uh, I would like to thank Laura and Jessica for your really outstanding And certainly thank all of you for being here and your excellent questions. And uh, Professor Hales, uh, thank you for an absolutely fantastic uh, inaugural uh, uh, talk. We hope we'll have you back. It's incredibly reassuring to know that you appreciate your alma mater and haven't forgotten where it all began. I think this is inspirational to some of our students. Uh, we have a couple small tokens of appreciation. Uh, one is from the administration uh, for you. There's a card and uh, a present. We can open this later if need be. And then I, I have another uh, small present for you, a mouse pad 
uh, with the RIT logo. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone.